We at Church of the Lakes believe we are a church on the move as we work toward connecting all to Christ to become healthy in God and courageous in love. This morning we are completing a series of messages on the various parables of Jesus. We've been in this series for 13 weeks. I hope it hasn't felt long to you. I've actually really enjoyed it, uh, the series that we've been in. Jesus was a master storyteller, and he taught in what were known as parables. Parables, for those of you maybe tuning in for the first time, is nothing more than a simple story that teaches a spiritual lesson or a spiritual truth that is meant to draw you in, to draw us into the reality of God and God's kingdom. You know, as we're winding down this series, there's just a few uh, parting comments I want to leave with you before we get into the parable uh, of focus for today. The first is this. The parables of Jesus are not necessarily uplifting or affirming. They're not. Instead, they are designed, really intentionally designed, to challenge every attitude and aspect of our lives that is incongruent or misaligned with kingdom of God values and principles. That's the point of the parables. We've said it every week that the parables of Jesus both love on us and shove on us. The reality is they shove on us way more than they love on us. Third and final, parables treat our sin as a problem to be solved as God would have it, not as a tension to be, um, uh, what I say, tension to be managed as we would have it. Think of all of the parables of God or the parables of Jesus as a jigsaw puzzle. The finished puzzle is just this beautiful and comprehensive picture of the kingdom of God. And this morning we are going to look at a final parable and the, the, the whole parable is on the necessity, the need, the, really the blessing of this thing called prayer. Friends, if, if we as the people of God are people of anything, we are people of prayer. Something we say often at Church of the Lakes is we are a congregation that believes in the power of prayer. And this morning, Jesus is going to offer a teaching on the necessity of being persistent prayers. It's in Luke 18, starting in verse 1. Listen to God's word this morning. Then Jesus told them a parable about the need to pray always and to not lose heart. He said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city, there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, Grant me justice against my opponent or my adversary. For a while he refused, but later he said to himself, Though I have no fear of God, though I have no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice, so that she may not wear me out with her continually coming to me. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, I thank you uh, for this morning. The blessing it is to be in worship uh, with your a piece of your family here on earth. And I just ask, as I offer reflection on your life-giving word, that you'd bless the words of my lips, the meditation of all our hearts, that they be a prophet to us and acceptable to you. For you indeed are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So Jesus, this master storyteller, had this uncanny ability to take a difficult spiritual truth or reality and make it very raw, real, and relevant. So in this parable in particular, Jesus, what he does is he pits a mean, self-centered, self-serving, unjust judge against an afflicted, pitiful, and very, very, very annoying widow. <laughs> the, the judge could be described as somebody with lack of character and a total disregard for people. I'm guessing he's the kind of guy that kicks puppies for sport. Okay, that, that's this unjust judge in this parable. The widow, on the other hand, is what the preachers down south would say is a person who could worry the horns off a billy goat. She was what Jesus described as very persistent. Uh, persistent maybe could be also translated as annoying, worrisome, or my favorite, just relentless. She was like that young child who asks her father for another bowl of ice cream. 
and knows that if she keeps asking him for that bowl of ice cream, he will finally give in and give it to her. Yes, that's a personal experience story there, but I digress. Jesus takes these colorful characters, pits them against each other in order to teach his disciples, to teach us a lesson on what effective prayer looks like. I think, friends, the reason Jesus sets this parable in here is because Jesus knew something about the human heart, about people. And what he knew about people is people tended not to pray. And if people did pray or do pray, they tend not to do so persistently. George Mueller, a 19th century, just incredible human being, man of God. If you want to read a biography on just a a pillar of the faith, George Mueller is that guy. But in regards to what we're talking about, this is what he said. He said, the great fault of the children of God is that they do not continue in prayer. They do not persevere. If they desire anything for God's glory, they should pray until they get it. (laughs) If I were a betting man... And I'm not a betting man. Uh, Methodist preachers forbid gambling. So I'm not a betting man. I'm not a gambler. But if I was a betting man, I would say the majority of us in here would have to confess that our prayer life is not what it ought to be. Now, I don't say that at all with a spirit of judgment because I would throw myself into that category. My prayer life, even as a pastor, is not what it ought to be. And the reality is, friends, it's not that we don't know how to pray, it's just that we don't, right? It's not that we don't have time to pray, it's just that we don't. Look, it's not my intention this morning to guilt you into being better prayers, okay? What I want us to understand and even celebrate is this reality that we get to pray. We don't have to pray, we get to pray. It is both a privilege and a responsibility of the people of God. Friends, we are offered by our God, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. We are given by our God this opportunity to talk to him, to converse with him, to dialogue with him. What a privilege, amen? Look, Jesus wants us to understand that persistent prayer is the one thing that proves our faith above any and everything else. And faith is what points us to Jesus. This morning, I want to give you three things, three ways that persistent prayer proves our faith when looking at this particular scripture text from Luke 18. Here's the first one. Persistent prayer acknowledges our dependency on God. I love it. Verse 3 of Luke 18, we read these words again. Jesus says, In that city there was a widow who kept coming to Jesus and saying, Grant me justice against my accuser. Now, one thing that is evident in this parable is that the uh, widow is absolutely relentless. We don't know who her adversary is. We don't know what actually happened. But we do know that she is absolutely desperate for justice. So in that culture, uh, widows and orphans in particular were the underserved in society. Just as a digression, that's one reason why James qualifies what Christianity is in his letter to the early church when he says true religion is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself polluted from the world. Because James knew that the most underserved people in society were widows and were orphans. Um, So they were the most underserved in society. More often than not, they went hungry. They were homeless. They... uh, just lived in extreme poverty. Best case scenario, this widow could count on a life of hardship. And yet she also has an adversary. An adversary who's made her horrible life that much worse, that much more unbearable. We don't know if she's facing an eviction, a lawsuit, bankruptcy. But what we do know is she has found herself in a situation where this judge, this unjust judge was her only hope. For help. How are the judges and a nice guy, right? The judge has as much regard for this woman as say you or I would have for a cockroach crawling across our kitchen counter, okay? And if this were up to the judge, he would completely ignore this woman, this widow, because she did not serve his self-interest. She was not a benefit to him at all climbing the social ladder, but ignoring her wasn't going to be an option. She persisted in getting his attention. I'm sure she called his secretary every day to set up a meeting. She probably camped out at the courthouse. 
She probably followed him home after his shift was done. She probably knocked on his door at all hours of the evening. She probably sent him emails and voicemails and text messages. She wrote on his social Facebook wall. She DM'd his Twitter account, okay? I'm certain he tried to avoid her, tried to ignore her, tried to hide from her, but she just kept getting through. And for the widow, this judge wasn't her last resort. This judge was her obvious answer. So she pushed and she prodded and she pleaded and she finally gained access. And that's the first picture of how persistent faith or persistent prayer proves our faith. The reason I say that, that persistent prayer uh, proves our faith in one way it does is by acknowledging our dependency. It's because we, when we acknowledge dependency, what we're actually saying is we don't have the control that we need to deal with the situation. We don't have the power to fix the actual problem we are facing. So we acknowledge our dependency on the one who does have the power and the one who is in control. Persistent prayer acknowledges our dependence on God. Here's number two. Persistent prayer gives access to God's presence. I think it's safe to say that this widow lived a very judge-centered life. What do I mean by that? This widow knew the judge's schedule, his days off, where he lived, where he ate, who he hung out with. She knew he enjoyed long walks on the beach at midnight and coming to Church of Lakes on Sunday morning to hear our awesome praise team lead us in worship. And the reason she knew all of these things was because she was constantly in his presence. She couldn't help but know these things. And friends, when we pray persistently, we find out a lot about the heart of God. Like God's character is revealed to us through prayer. We experience his kindness. We come to the realization of his holiness and his righteousness. We cannot help but know these things about God when we are persistently talking to God. So when I meet with Christians that seem to be struggling with besetting or debilitating sins, one thing that a lot of them have in common is that they talk very little to God. Now, I'm not saying that those who pray without ceasing never struggle with sin. In fact, those of you who pray without ceasing probably are more aware of your sin than anyone else. But here's the typical pattern of those who, who have debilitating sin but don't talk to God a lot. We don't pray, therefore we, we don't experience God's presence. We don't experience God's presence, therefore we're not conformed to his image or his likeness or his will. We don't conform in his image and likeness and will, therefore we never gain victory over the besetting and debilitating sins that plague our lives. I think one of the main reasons for the godlessness we see in the American church today is the lack of prayer in the American church today. Godless, godlessness is caused by prayerlessness. But let me pause for a moment and, and tease something out with you. Oftentimes when Jesus tells a parable, the character that he's focused on in the story represents somebody else. Maybe that character represents himself or, or, or God the Father or the church or the gospel or his disciples or maybe an unbeliever. But usually the character represents someone else. You get to the parable of the widow and the unjust judge. Who do you think the unjust judge represents? At surface, it appears he represents God, right? But that kind of makes me uneasy. Does it make anyone else uneasy? And the reason it makes me uneasy is because if I know anything about our God, it's he is not unjust. Our God is a God of justice. Our God is a God of grace, a God of mercy, not a God who is unjust. You know, biblical scholars have universally agreed, which is really surprising that they all agree on something, but they universally agree that the unjust judge in this parable is actually set up in contrast to God, not in comparison to him. I would go so far to say the widow in the story is also set up in contrast and not in comparison to the modern day Christian in America. The reason I say that is let's be honest. Unlike the widow, we are not persistent in prayer. We give up on God long before this widow gave up on this unjust judge, if we ever get started to begin with. Friends, let me give you a simple definition of prayer. 
Prayer is just simply talking to God, telling him what you need, meditating on his clearly revealed will in his life-giving word, but the principle of prayer is much more important than the process of it. It's not that we don't know how to pray, it's that we don't pray, right? In fact, how you pray doesn't matter as much as that you pray. Jesus is saying just pray. Persistent prayer assures us of God's presence. If you want more of God's presence in your life, pray. Here's number three. Persistent prayer also assumes God's provision. I know we don't usually like to make assumptions, right? But this is an assumption we can make. Persistent prayer assumes God's provision. Friends, do you understand that everything you have, every good gift you have has come from the very hand of God? Like we live within a culture, society that wants to believe we're self-made people. We're not. Nobody's self-made. Everything we get and have been given, every opportunity, everything is given from the hand of God. Go back to the parable, verse 7. Jesus says, And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, no, he will quickly grant justice to them. Again, we remember that the judge in this story is set up in contrast, not in comparison to God. So the point Jesus is trying to make here it is, big point. If an unrighteous, self-centered, self-serving judge can finally break down and give mercy to this poor widow, how much more? will God give to those whom he loves so much that he sent his son Jesus to die for? Friends, think of it this way. God gave his one and only son for you. He abandoned his son in his moment of greatest need. Why? So that in your moment of greatest need, you could boldly approach his throne room. You could know he will provide for your needs. How dare we question God's love and provision for us? When that question has been fully answered in the cross that his son died on. If God sent Jesus, if he is the father who gives good gifts, then we can assume his provision. You know, this giver of good gifts, the way God is described, you see it littered all throughout the scriptures. Uh, One, I think, uh, very clear way is demonstrated in Luke 11 and another teaching of Jesus, just a few chapters before this one. Let me give you two verses of that. It's it's the the story where Jesus says, Ask and it will be given, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened to you. And then he goes on with this. He says, If there's anyone among you, if your child asks for a fish, would give a snake? If your child asks for an egg, would, would you give a scorpion? If you then who are evil, if you then who are far from God, if you then who live misaligned and incongruent with the ways and wills and word of God, If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father give you the Holy Spirit if you but only ask? Friends, God expects we're going to come to him in prayer. Our prayers are not actually annoying to God. He takes delight in them. He expects us to want to converse with him. He takes pleasure in that conversation. He wants us to pray and provide for the needs of our prayers always and forever. I think the important thing to know is that the persistent widow in our parable f- found that her plea for justice had finally paid off. But here's the lingering question for us today. What happens when it doesn't? What happens when our prayers seemingly go unanswered? What happens when God appears to be silent? Some of you maybe are there right now. Can I answer that with a question? Here it is. What if God's answer to your prayer is just the opposite of what you were hoping for? But looking back on it, you've come to realize that he still answered it in a way that was in your best interest and that gave him the greatest of glory. This is something that became very real to me that I learned five years ago when my own dear mother was diagnosed with a a terminal cancer. My mother, if I, I, I've, I've used her before in illustration, so please give me the grace to use her again because she's just an amazing human being. My mother was one of the most faithful persons of God I have ever had the privilege and joy of knowing. She, she was a person whose prayer life could be described as deep, persistent, and steadfast. You know, a couple of days before her funeral and we were kind of going through some of her things, we found like a, 
a box full of old prayer journals that she, she wrote. Just a woman of deep and persistent prayer. On that day in April of 2019, I was actually at Great Wolf Lodge with my kids, my family, enjoying time with them. My mom calls to, to give us this news, and we are face-to-face with this, this reality of my mom's illness. Well, one of the most significant things that changed in my prayer life in that moment was prayer was no longer something that was casual to me. It wasn't something I approached nonchalantly or in a casual manner. No, everything I, I had um, up to uh, understanding prayer at that moment changed. Instead, I gave everything I had to God praying for my mom to be miraculously healed. Like this Methodist preacher almost became a full-fledged Pentecostal, all right? I was naming it and claiming it. I was stabbing it and grabbing it. I was praying against this wicked evil of cancer in Jesus' name. I I was praying against my own unbelief, praying through the promises that God has laid out in the Bible. I reminded God as if God has amnesia of all the ways he has miraculously healed people in the past and how he needed to do that for my mother now. Friends, I have no doubt that I was praying as persistently as a widow in Luke 18 was praying. I went to God every single day, multiple times a day, begging, pleading with him to give my mother justice against her adversary, this cancer. But on August 12, 2019, my prayers for this dear woman, my mother, ceased. Her battle with pancreatic cancer came to an abrupt end. She breathed her last breath on earth. Now, if you're a skeptic, This score story gives you all the ammunition you need, right, to argue why God doesn't exist. It may even strengthen your resolve against having a relationship with God. Like, why would God take the life of a person who was always living for him? Why did God fail to answer our prayers? Did he ignore our requests? Did he not care? (laughs) Listen, prayer involves communication in the spiritual realm. And what I mean by that Because it involves communication in the spiritual realm, sometimes we get spiritual answers to our physical requests. Spiritual answers to physical requests. I can tell you that God did care. And even looking back, I can tell you our prayers were answered. Was she healed? Absolutely. Was it the way I was praying for her to be healed? Well, initially, no. (laughs) But eventually it became that way. You see, my mother understood as the Apostle Paul understood that to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Was my prayer for my mother answered? Yes. If I could rewrite the story today, would I rewrite it? I actually wouldn't. And here's why. As a church, we're resurrection people, amen? We don't serve a God of the dead. We serve a God of the living, And the lessons my mother taught her family on her deathbed could never have been taught any other way. Family relations that were estranged for years, this talk about a miracle of God, were healed, fastened back together because of my mother's testimony in her dying days. Was it a joy for me, her son, to preside over her funeral and declare with the church in heaven and on earth, where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? Friends, sometimes we receive spiritual answers to physical requests. And in the process, as Paul says, we become transformed from one degree of glory to the next. Church, we have to pray. It is not our last resort. It is our very first opportunity. It's where God reveals himself to us and what he's doing in our lives. It shapes our wants. It clarifies our needs. God, his ears that are open to hear. Will we be a people who call upon him? Will we be a people who converse with him? It's not that we don't know how to pray. It's just that we don't. Friends, let's be the people We tell others we are, let's be a people who believe in the power and the provision of prayer. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Oh, Lord God, with the help of your Holy Spirit in the midst of this moment, I ask with boldness that you'd make us into a people who believe in the importance and in the power of prayer. God, help us to celebrate the fact that 
that we don't only have to pray, but we get to pray. That you, oh God, have graciously given us a pathway, a, a, a medium to converse with you. Lord, our, as faith is proven in our praying, may we be a people who, who not only acknowledge our dependency on you, help us to not only be a people who are given access to your presence when we pray, but may we also be a people who are fully assured that, that when we do pray, you will provide for our needs. So God, in the midst of this moment, the this, this silence and the stillness of this, this minute, we want to take a moment to come before you now and silently name our needs before you. Hear God, now the longing of each of our hearts. Oh, Lord God, creator of us all, thank you for hearing each and every one of our prayers and for answering all of them in due season and in accordance to your will. It's in Christ's name we pray all of this. And all God's people said, amen.